Well, good afternoon and welcome to our webinar. This is Human Factors in Cybersecurity. I'm Kelly Paletta, Director of Sales and Marketing at EXP Technical. Uh, you know, I noticed in the registrations, there were a lot of folks there in attendance that have attended events in the past, so welcome back. Um, if you're new, if you've not have attended one of our events in the past, welcome. Uh, at EXP Technical, we provide IT support to hundreds of small and medium-sized businesses here in the Puget Sound region. And this year, we're celebrating our 20th anniversary, 20 years in business. And community is one of our highest values here at EXP Technical. And one way that we're celebrating this, um, our 20th anniversary, is by giving back in the form of this webinar series. And one thing that you might notice is that our webinars typically are not a sales rep or a marketing person delivering a sales pitch or a product demo. Instead, our goal here is to bring uh, folks to your attention that might be thought leaders, have unique perspectives, subject matter expertise, and give them a platform where they can speak directly to business leaders here. We live, learn, work, and play here in the Pacific Northwest, and we firmly believe that if our neighbors do well, EXP Technical will do well too. So our intention with these events is to give you information that will help you run your business more efficiently, more secure, more effectively. Um, you know, we want to supercharge your business and make it secure. And, and events like this are one way that we can do that and give back to our community, uh, which leads to uh, our agenda today is that I'll uh, go through my administrative announcements that we're in right now. And very quickly, I will introduce our guest presenter today, who is Mark Dupuy from the University of Washington. Uh, we have, you know, I'll confess that there is about 55 or so, I think 56 people registered for this event. So it's a fairly small group. And because of that, I hope we can keep it kind of informal. I would encourage you if you have questions to submit questions as the presentation is going on. We do have prepared information and a contiguous presentation that we'll run through, but we plan on having a lot of time at the end or some time at the end for questions and answers. So I strongly encourage you to submit questions via the Q&A feature in Zoom. You could add comments in the chat if you feel like it, um, but know that it's not a huge audience and uh, uh, for lack of a better term, it's a safe space. You can share your, your questions or your concerns or your comments. And I will do my best at the end of the session to moderate those questions and pose those to our guest presenter. One question that comes up every time we host one of these events is, is this session being recorded? And the answer today is yes, this session is being recorded. It will be available to you. Look for email from me in the next week or so um, that will uh, include a link to the recording and presentation materials and other follow-up information. So be on the lookout for that. Our last presentation, for those of you that were in attendance, we weren't able to record because our, our guest presenter was an FBI agent. Um, but for this one and for all of our other web webinars, we do uh, record and, and offer that information to you later on. And I'm going to, before I introduce our speaker, I'm going to try something I've never done before. So bear with me. This is a learning experience. But if it worked out right. I should have just launched a poll and we'll see if we get any responses on that. But it's a poll related to our subject matter today. And it is, has anyone recently, and let's say in the last six months or year or so, used fear, shame, or regret to encourage you to engage in cyber secure behavior? And I'll give this a, a minute or two before I end the poll and we'll revisit it perhaps later in our session here. Give another, looks like we've got over 20. And wh while we're waiting for the last few answers on that, I will segue into my introduction of our guest speaker. So we're really fortunate to have Professor Mark Dupuy joining us. He is a professor at UW Bothell and um, has a, a PhD, is a certified ethical hacker. But one of the reasons why we, I was really interested in adding him to our webinar series and presenting, allowing him to present to you is because he has uh, uh, definitely a unique perspective. His background not only is in cybersecurity and technology, but he also has a, a bachelor's and a master's in political science. So much of the research that he's engaged in and much of the papers that he has published are not just on technology and IP addresses and, and arcane details like that, but instead at the intersection of human behavior and technology, which is where things get really interesting. And so with that, it's probably a good time for, for me to step aside. So Mark, when you're ready, feel free. I'm going to end the poll right now. 
and feel free to, um, we'll share the results too. We'll see how that works. Uh, but uh, feel free to share your screen, Mark, and begin speaking, and I'll put myself on mute, and um, you can go right ahead there. Great. Sure thing. Thank you for the introduction, and thank you for having me here. Um, I always enjoy the opportunity to talk about human factors of cybersecurity. Uh, it's, an, it's an area that kind of fell into my lap. I was um, in my first quarter of the PhD program, and I was originally going to do like social media look at, because I had a, a political discussion forum at the time. And I, I just like, well, it was just seemed natural to maybe study that. But then uh, I was working on this proposal in the first quarter. And I just had no motivation, no incentive, no passion behind it. And then I just started thinking in my head, I'm like, what? You know, I started thinking about the six months prior where I was helping friends and family members with issues on their computer. And in each case, it was, you know, significant malware infections on their computer. And I'm like, started wondering, like, what is it about this? These, these perfectly intelligent, reasonable, smart people that is causing this to happen to them. And, and ever since then, I haven't looked back. I've been going down the road of human factors of cybersecurity, trying to better understand why people do the things they do, why they don't do the things that maybe they should do, and what can we maybe try and do about it. And so, um, again, my name is Mark Dupuy. I'm an associate professor with the University of Washington. And I'm just going to give us some brief background on myself. I I worked at the University of Washington. I want to say this is year 11 and I've really enjoyed it. I, I spent a few years at UW Tacoma and I've been at UW Bothell now for, this is my eighth year. Um, I've done some consulting. I mentioned the political discussion website. For about eight years, I walk, worked for the Washington State Division of Disability Determination Services. I was in the Navy and I, I was also uh, before that when I was a student uh, in Bellingham, I uh, did some work for the Washington State Attorney General's Office, the Consumer Protection Division. I did that as part of an internship. I volunteered there, did some work study there, and, and uh, learned quite a bit. It was a good experience. Uh, educational background, I like going to school, um, and I, I keep trying to think to myself now, how can I find time to go back and maybe get another degree or something? Um, but let's not let my wife hear that because I don't think she'd be super motivated about that with how busy everything is. But, uh, you know, and, and this isn't in order, actually. I, I went back after I was already had my PhD to um, to use some benefits I had to at, at Central Washington University because I had some uh, online programs. And so I did that after everything else. Uh, those two degrees. And so much of my research and so much of what I'm interested in uses psychology and trying to understand the psychological aspect of human behavior as it relates to cybersecurity. And so I'm like, I'm like, hey, this looked like a good opportunity. So, um, and, and it was fun. Uh, my research interests, you know, fear appeals, shame and regret. Um, and more recently, my colleagues and I were looking at maybe forgiveness in organizations. Is there a role uh, for, for that? Um, I also look at social networking and privacy concerns uh, and uh, look into personality and affect and try and relate that to human behavior and cybersecurity, um, as well as some GRC type stuff and insider threats. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to kind of lay the, the groundwork a little bit about, about what the human factors of cybersecurity is and maybe why it is such a big challenge for us and for the people that are that are there, you know, our employees and those that are using these systems that we have in front of them. Um, so, you know, cybersecurity, very much an art and a science. It's one of the things that I really like about it is, you know, I have some colleagues here that are very much in the technical side of things. You know, they're building systems, they're analyzing, you know, network packets, they're trying to do uh, understand adversarial machine learning, all these other cool things. And, and for my side of things, I'm trying to understand the human behavioral side of it and maybe sometimes the artistic or the art side of it as well. And I think that's what to me is so great about cybersecurity is it it's able to bring in so many different backgrounds and interests and kind of there's a way that almost anyone can contribute to cybersecurity. Um, and, and one of the things that with, with people in, in human behavior is this propensity for this underestimation of risk, right? And specifically, we have this underestimation of risk for ourselves. And so, you know, just as an example, if you're doing something that maybe someone else would consider risky, you may not consider it so risky. But if you flip the things around and you saw them doing that, you might be like, well, that's not a good idea. Uh, and maybe we've seen some of those videos online where people are doing just that. And I also think too, like, oh, if I'm driving a little bit over the speed limit, well, it's, it's 
I know what I'm doing. I'm being careful. I'm being safe. Um, but you know, this other person probably not so much, right? We we see this play out also in cybersecurity, how we use our computers, the websites we visit, the things we download, so on and so forth. And, and it's a challenge. It's it's a challenge. Um, and it's, it's but it's part of human behavior, and it's one of these things that we have to contend with, right? Um, and then there's this other aspect of it called risk homeostasis. So a lot of times when I, I show this slide, I'm like, I'm like, okay, you know, this is this is a beautiful, you know, kind of cliff you're looking over. How close are you willing to get to it, right? And you see this protective barrier there, and, and I know it doesn't look that great. It looks a little rusted uh, and, and a little worn down and stuff. Uh, you can see the rust nail spots and things. But if that wasn't there, would you get as close as you would with it being there? And, and, and the answer for most people, and I sometimes I take this to the extreme and I think of the Grand Canyon, the answer for most people is no. You know, if there's a protective barrier, I'm willing to get a little bit closer and then, and then look over. And we see the same thing play out in cybersecurity for better and worse. And I'll give an example of that is if I'm using my computer and, uh, you know, and I have backups of everything, I have anti-malware software installed, um, I'm feeling pretty good about the measures I'm taking, maybe I'm more likely to engage in riskier behavior because I feel like I'm protected. Um, but, the, but the problem there and, and the challenge there is you want to have a net increase in, in security. And if, as you build up these mechanisms, you take riskier, riskier behavior, it, it's almost kind of this leveling effect, this, this homeostasis where it kind of balances things out. And that's not always what we're after, always what we're going, going for, uh, but it's something to at least be aware of that that can happen. And I also want to mention too, feel free anytime if there's any questions or anything, feel free to interrupt me or, or anything else. I'm not um, you know, determined to just go through every single slide and then have Q&A at the end. So if there's anything in between, feel free just to, to let me know. Um, one of the other big challenges that all of you here and, and myself and as all of us contend with is how abstract security is for the average everyday person. You know, they they have maybe some security solutions right on their computer. Maybe they even install them. But what exactly is it doing? What exactly is it protecting your computer and yourself and your information from? And and maybe us who maybe are more knowledgeable in this area, you know, maybe we have a good idea, right? But you think about the average everyday person. You know, it, it, it's kind of this this black box. Things are going on. We don't really know what's going in, what's going out, and what's not happening, and what is happening. Um, so it's a very big challenge how abstract cyber cybersecurity is, and it, it creates this big disconnect between us trying to say, "Hey, security is important." Uh, you know, we want to make sure you're not clicking on links and these these emails. We want to make sure you're doing X, Y, and Z. But it's so abstract to them that it's sometimes hard to get their buy-in. Um, however, actually doing security is not abstract at all, right? And you think about the things you're at, maybe we're asking people to do sometimes, it takes real time, money, energy, effort, so on and so forth. And, and so again, you have this big mismatch between the abstract nature, what you're wasting all your real time, money and energy doing and not really understanding the full benefit of it, what you're trying to protect yourself or your company from. And, um, you know, and, and so it, it creates challenges for us. It creates challenges when we're trying to get that buy-in. Um, and, and another challenge that we see is these lo losses generally aren't perceived as, uh, are perceived as greater than gains. And so, you know, and, and this, a lot of this comes from what's called cumulative prospect theory from um, Kahneman and Tversky that doesn't, amazing research there many years ago from I think the 70s, 80s, and so on. But what this, how this maybe applies to the prior two slides is this loss of time, energy, and effort um, is, is hard to kind of counterbalance with the actual uh, benefits we might see from cybersecurity. And um, again, it's just another challenge we face. Don't worry, I mean, this isn't going to be all, all gloom or anything, but it's kind of set things up with some of the challenges we face and, and why things are the way they are. And why maybe some of you are frustrated with your employees not, you know, maybe 
at least uh, it seems not taking security as seriously as you would like them to. And, but there's a lot of reasons behind this, right? And, and I think for me, one of the big ones is security for most people and for most employees is a secondary task. And most people don't, you know, get up, get ready, go to work and get behind their computer. And it's like, I'm gonna go do security now, right? No, security just gets in their way. And it's just another thing that maybe we're throwing on them, asking them to do, that has really nothing at all to do with their actual job, the actual reason they're there behind the computer in the first place. And so in, in some ways it's, it's kind of unfair that we're asking them to do this. And I'm not saying don't ask them to do this. I'm just saying, again, trying to understand it from the perspective of the average everyday employee for, for which cybersecurity is not a part of their, their main job, it's putting an additional burden on them that they probably don't have any real training or expertise behind. And you know it, it ends up resulting in issues, right? Issues that we all have to deal with from time to time. One of the things that we can do to really help with cybersecurity is trying to improve what's called self-efficacy. And what self-efficacy is is, 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 it's, is it's our own belief in our ability to do a certain task or to perform a certain activity, right? And self-efficacy has been used, you know, a lot to try to understand student success in, in grade school, middle school, and so on, um, why people uh, act, take an action or why they don't. Well, if they have higher levels of self-efficacy, they're much more likely to perform a specific action that they need to do, or maybe that's requested of them. And so improving self-efficacy, and I know Kelly was talking earlier about, you know, a lot of the great videos they have on their website and stuff, all that's important. It can help them feel more confident in being able to understand a, a specific threat situation, like a phishing email, and then taking appropriate action and whatever that may be for your organization, deleting it, notifying IT, Again, whatever that may be. So I can talk a little bit about some of the research that my colleagues and I have, have conducted. Um, my, and so the fear appeal research, my colleague, uh, Karen Renault from um, in, in Scotland, we've done a lot of research on fear appeals. And you know the thing about fear appeals is they've been used for centuries, right? Or millennia. And, and really what it is, is trying to make people care which I don't know, I have, I have two young kids and I, I can you know, I have questionable beliefs in how effective fear appeals are because when I try and use a little bit of it, I'm like, why aren't they responding the way I think they should be? Um, you know, and, and, and the thought behind this is if people are fearful, maybe they're more likely to care and using emotions such as fear can help overcome um, the, 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 lack of knowledge reli reliably converting to behavior. And so this meme down here is really just an example of an ad campaign. I think it's from New York or New York City. And it's just trying to illustrate like, hey, let's, let's get people's attention, let's scare them, but then let's also tell them what they can do to lessen the chance for this thing to go bad, for this harm to be realized, right? And that's, that's important, you know, just scaring people isn't always gonna be effective. You have to kind of give them the tools on how to actually be successful in trying to mitigate whatever that threat might be. And, you know, I, I think this is a really interesting one, you know, hit at 40 miles per hour, 70% chance they'll die. But if they're hit at 30 miles per hour, 80% chance they'll live. That's why it's 30 miles per hour. So again, very clear communication, but using fear, trying to get their attention. Um, and, you know, I, I think it can, can be pretty effective. And I think this is a pretty effective example of using a fear appeal to try and get people to behave in a certain way. However, <laughs> uh, again, there's always proponents of fear appeals that consider them efficacious, uh, while others kind of consider them misguided. That it's, it's just based on intuition with weak evidence. Okay, there's the, overall this lack of consensus. Do they actually work? And just as a couple examples, there's this program called Scared Straight. And I've, I've seen it probably pick, depicted more on TV than I have actually uh, seen it um, in real life or experienced it. But the idea of Scared Straight is, is taking kind of what are perceived as at-risk youth, bringing them to a jail or a police station or a prison and trying to scare the daylights out of them. That, hey, if you go down this road of crime or mischief, this is where you're gonna end up. 
and they might even have them talk to some inmates or something else. And, um, you know, the thinking behind this, well, of course, this is going to work. They're not going to want to do this. Well, subsequent, you know, the initial research, and again, a lot of it on intuition, maybe said, oh, maybe this does work. But then subsequent research said, well, wait a minute. They found that uh, there was a higher rate of incarceration and troubles with the legal system for those that actually went through such programs. Um, that's, that's not what they're going for, right? It's not what they're going after. Um, another program was uh, called Baby Doll. And I think this is actually still used. And I remember seeing this in high school, a variation of this, where high school students would basically have something that kind of mimicked a, a, a doll of some kind. They would treat it like their baby. And they'd have it for maybe a week or something. They'd have to get up with it through the night if it was hungry or, or, or you know, needed a diaper change or something else. And sometimes people would work in teams on this. Again, let's scare teens from having unprotected sex. Let's make sure that they're being responsible and, and let's reduce, you know, teen pregnancy. Again, intuitively, it, it makes sense. And again, some initial results maybe showed some that it, it had some promise. But then later results said, hey, again, wait a minute, uh, that there was higher rates of teen pregnancy in places where these programs were implemented, not what they were going after. And maybe people like, oh, this is fun or this would be really cool. Uh, but again, not really what they were going after. Uh, and, and so another area that we've looked at is the ethics of fear appeals. And, you know, it's interesting, we're working on this initial uh, paper, just looking at fear appeals, just doing a big review of them. And I started writing the ethics section and it's just getting, it started getting bigger and bigger and bigger, all the possible issues. We ended up making a paper by itself that's freely accessible online, just the ethics of cybersecurity fear appeals. And um, some of the things that we kind of came to with the conclusion is, you know, if we're going to do research in this area from a fear appeal standpoint, we need to make sure we have ethics approval in our institution. Um, and we want to make sure that the cybersecurity benefits are, you know, things that people can relate to. They're salient for people that they're like, oh, this is what I can actually do. This is what I'm going to get, get out of it. Um, and when deception is used, it needs to be justified. And, you know, as researchers, there's times where we use some deception. There's times where it's very clear cut what we're studying. We don't use deception. But if we're going to be doing that in the, in the context of a fear appeal, we really need to make sure that we're justified in doing that, that we provide some level of justification that the potential harm um, is far outweighed by the potential benefits we can get from using a fear appeal or in this specific context, studying uh, the, the efficacy of a fear appeal. And can, can I yeah. interrupt? I just, Please so I, do. I, uh, because you mentioned deception, what are examples of deception? Is that like where a study purports to be about one thing, but it's another? Or is it where you make people believe that something has happened? Can, can you give examples? Yeah, that, that actually, if those are good examples. And, um, and, and so an example where you let people know that, or you tell people that, this, hey, this study is about trying to understand, um, you know, how people think of a specific user interface. And so I've done a study like this where, where we, we brought people in and we interviewed them, we had them use this, this website. But you know, in order for us to test if it was really effective or not, we couldn't tell them what we were testing because then it could really skew the results. And so we said, we're just trying to understand what you think about the user interface, the design, how, how user friendly it is. What we were really testing in that study is uh, what, what we, um, my student and I developed was a peer feedback meter. And that's where, you know, the tr traditional password meter says, uh, you know, how strong it is or how the bar, a graph bar, you know, red if it's weak, yellow if it's maybe not too weak, and then green if it's really strong. We did a take on that where we, in, instead of that, we, we did use that as well as a comparison group. But we said, this is how strong your password is in comparison to other registered users. And, and it would update in real time as they're typing in their password, just like a regular, you know, password meter. And we're trying to test, you know, by using peer feedback, would it result in stronger passwords? Um, and, and so that, that's just an example of, of a case where we might use deception. And in that case, it's justified because if we didn't use it and we said, we're just trying to test if you'll create a stronger password by using this, 
well, that, that really kind of makes the results invalid at that point. So, um, you know, and with respect to a fear pill, it would be something similar where, um, you know, I'm trying to uh, test the how effective it is. And I might say that here, we're actually really doing something else. We're really just trying to see, you know, do you like the video or do you like, or what do you understand about backing up your data or something? And we're really, we're trying to maybe scare one group and another group, they watch some innocuous video of some kind, you know, some, some tame video. So good question though. Um, and, I, and the other important thing with fear appeals is making sure that you tell them what they should do, right? We don't want to just scare them. It's important for us to actually tell them, well, here's what you should do. And I mentioned that earlier, right? Here's what you should do. And as we, you know, conduct these studies or deploy fear appeals is to make sure you have some kind of calibration that you're, you don't just launch a big thing with a whole bunch of people, but you kind of maybe start off small. So you kind of know, is it effective? But you also know, is this too much? Are we scaring people too much, right? A lot of a lot of issues uh, at play, and you know, deep, debrief after deployment. That goes a lot of to the research, as letting people know what you did, why you did it, and maybe what the results were if you have those available. So, um, and, and so this this is a lot of numbers, <laughs> but this this goes back to one of the concerns my colleague uh, Karen and I raised in our initial paper is we have these things called fear pills and we assume that what we're eliciting is fear. You know, like, well, if we scare someone, of course it's fear that we're causing, right? And that just isn't necessarily the case. And so uh, what we did in this study is we launched a fear appeal study and we had a control group where they received, um, I, think, I think I showed them a video of, just scenery or something. I don't want the scenery to be too nice because I don't want to put them at, at, at ease too much. I don't want it, I don't want it, I don't want it, to, want it to be nothing. I just, you know, uh, very uh, neutral. Uh, but then I also had a video that just had the scary part of a fear pill. And, and then I had another video that just had the recommended actions part. And then my final video was the full fear appeal, which basically tried to scare them, but also told them what they could do about it. What this shows here, um, just to kind of break it down, on the left side are the different types of emotions or affect at play. And then highlighted in red, it's basically showing that whenever I had the scary part, and especially when I had the scary part by itself, without anything else, I caused increases in negative types of emotions or affect. And so, um, and, and so this, this was seen throughout these different groups when I compare, you know, the, the threat whenever there was a scary part to one that did not have that scary part, the, the, the fear part of it. Um, so we saw increases in negative affect, which is this kind of different kinds of affect all combined. We saw increases in fear, which again, makes sense. But we also saw increases in hostility. So after people that watched these videos, especially the ones that had the scary part, they had higher levels of hostility afterward. You know, is that, is that what we're going after? Uh, they also had higher levels of guilt. And so, you know, the, the point of this is we're not just targeting fear. We're not just causing a change in level of fear. We're also uh, causing an increase in other negative types of emotion. And at the same time, we're also decreasing what we consider positive types of emotion. And, and you see that on the left here, joviality, self-assurance, and uh, serenity. Serenity is considered more of a neutral type of affect, but I think of serenity as more positive just personally. Uh, but we saw uh, decreases in those for, again, those people that were having the, the, the scary part of the fear appeal video. And, and so this, this isn't to really say, never do it. It's not to say that maybe it isn't effective in some context, but it's to say that we take for granted um, a lot of what we think we know about fear pills, that we think they're going to be effective, that we think we are just eliciting fear, when in reality, at least based on this study, that that's not the case.
right? That maybe we need to be more judicious and maybe we need to kind of check ourselves a little bit when we decide to go down this road. Yeah. Any questions with, with any of the, the fear appeal stuff? It's, I I have a comment with, with respect to this. You know, you, yeah. you mentioned hostility and I'm thinking of corporate values and I doubt that any companies say, well, hostility is one of our corporate values. <laughs> uh, but if, right. if their IT department is, or if their operations manager or CEO or COO is continually using fear appeals to try to motivate cybersecure behavior, they may be breeding hostility and contempt. And I, I think that's your point, right? Is that there can be negative long-term implications of, of these sorts of approaches? Yeah, and that's what we have to be careful of. And there's just not enough good research to really know. And so, um, you know, and I, I think that's the the risk taking is we we don't know the long term impact and we don't know the long term efficacy. So if I keep scaring them, you know, is it really effective? And so I, I actually have an upcoming study where I'm going to measure this with different uh, physiological measures to test this scientifically. You know, does the effect of a fear appeal decrease based on someone's physiological signs like their galvanic skin response their 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 pulse their um you know other factors their eye dilation and pupil, pupil dilation and so on uh so I, i'm excited to do that because i think it's kind of the next thing is to really kind of measure this and, and test it out and, and just as an example in we don't really have this in in the united states but in a lot of european countries if you go to buy, buy a pack of cigarettes uh, on one, one side of it is this grotesque picture usually of this is what's going to happen and this is what's going to happen to you if you keep smoking cigarettes. And it's usually people with advanced cancer, other complications, maybe COPD and other complications largely attributable to their, uh, you know, chronic uh, sm smoking. And, but, okay, so, you know, a fear appeal, right? But, you know, and, and you think about this, what, what do you think the average smoker does as they buy their get their pack of cigarettes and they, they get out another cigarette i mean do they do they look at this and, and and look at that picture and like you know what i think now's the time to quit <laughs> <laughs> no they get that cigarette out and they light it up okay uh -huh. and, and and maybe the first time they see it maybe it gets their attention a little bit but subsequent times i'm, I'm not so sure and so again my, my future study this is one of the things we're going to look at is does it cause emotional arousal be in the same fear appeal repeatedly or even different fear appeals about the same topic. Um, so, you know, again, and a does, lot we take, yeah, go ahead. The, does the long-term desensitization to those images actually, do they feel like a sense of rugged individualism and, and look at how carefree I am or, you know, a little bit of that, that delight in that death wish of, oh, look at me, I'm a, a risk taker. I don't, or, you know, whatever the case may be. I wonder if, if, if long-term, if it does create those sort of emotions and, and may, maybe make people even more committed to smoking. I don't know. I, I, it's fascinating. Yeah. I'd be curious to hear what, what your studies and what other studies reveal on that. Yeah. And I think the whole risk perception and risk behavior, I've done a study on that many, many years ago. And it is interesting to see how people view different cybersecurity behaviors. In this case, it was backing up their own personal data. Um, but how that relates to a risk profile of an individual. And, and, and to your point, how repeated exposure to fear pills, how that baby can alter someone's risk profile, perhaps. You know, I, I don't know if it, if it could, but it's an interesting question, right? Um, again, just so much we don't know. And so, you know, my, my advice is just to be cautious as you think about using fear pills and not make too many assumptions about how effective you think they're going to be. Um, they may help. From an intuitive stand, stands, uh, they make a lot of sense, but um, we just don't have a lot of good evidence showing that they really are as effective as we think they are, um, especially long term. And, right. You know, I, I have to offer a confession, too, because I am in sales and marketing. And as a sales rep, I use fear appeals all that many people attending this event may have heard me use them, particularly with backup and disaster recovery. And in a sales meeting, it might take the form of me painting a very detailed picture of someday in the future. Suppose it's a Tuesday morning in the middle of tax season and you come in to find all of your files are encrypted. 
and you go to restore from your backups and you find that the last good backup that you have is three and a half months old. How do you feel? And it's a, a heavy handed, I apologize. To anybody, it's a heavy handed appeal to fear. Um, but uh, as a sales rep, my relation, I, I'm in, the solution is that I'm introducing them to the great consultants at eXp that, that are going to do test restores and monitor backups and do all those things to protect them. Uh, but this does make me rethink that approach too about, I, I'm okay if, if it increases a little hostility towards me as long as they love the guy that I introduce them to or, or uh, the man or woman that I introduce them to that's going to take great care of them in the future. But it, it's this discussion will make me cognizant of that moving forward, <laughs> and I formally apologize to anybody that I I put through that manipulation in the past. Don't worry, I'm not going to shame you, which is my next slide. I'm not going to oh. shame you. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, and, and again, which leads to <laughs> yeah, they've been used for thousands of years, right? Religions have used them. Politicians, as my surprise, you they're using them all the time, right? Uh, if you don't vote for me, this is what's going to happen. How are you going to avoid this? Vote for me, right? Um, so, you know, and then even looking at, at shame, kind of the, the, the next aspect of this, right, is, um, you know, shaming is, and some organizations do this. Some organizations say, hey, if you click a phishing email link, we're going to let everyone know it was you. Or if you cause some incident in an organization, we're going to tell everyone about it, right? And, and the challenge with this is it creates a cultural, it creates an environment that really isn't conducive to employees just speaking up, to saying, hey, let's make things better. And, um, and, and you want an organization like that. You want an organization where employees are gonna feel like they can speak up, they can you know, do these things, and, you know, and they can be involved in, in trying to make the organization stronger and, and better. A lot of these mistakes can be made by anyone. Okay, and near mills, near misses can help us to reveal vulnerabilities that can actually be addressed, thereby preventing a real incident later. Um, but but blame itself, blame and shame is it, very corrosive, and uh, often exacerbates how bad people feel anyway about something that happened. And sometimes you maybe want them to feel bad because you're like, you know what, you're putting me through. You know how much this has cost us. Um, but when organizations instead focus on the why rather than the who more effective learning organizations are established. And we, we've seen this before where in the aftermath of an incident, for example, in, in the army, right? There's some incident that happens. Yeah, maybe there's someone that was that part partook in it that was more responsible for it actually happening. But these after incident uh, examinations, investigations and reports are more focused on why, you know, what conditions existed, what configurations perhaps existed, that allowed or caused this to happen or made it more likely for this to happen instead of just trying to shame someone that was maybe responsible for that specific occurrence of that, of that incident. So, um, you know, again, it's, it's, it's a challenge. And, you know, and a lot of these things I'm talking about, especially with shame and, and regret, it, it's, there's always exceptions. I'm not talking about your malicious employee, if there's a malicious insider threat or something like that, that's a totally different story, right? But most of the, things that happen are from non-malicious insiders. Accidents happen, right? They click on the email because they're not an expert in this. And I'll, I'll say, I'll give this little antidote that someone who uh, who is studies this a lot like myself would maybe consider more of an expert in phishing emails. When I have these cybersecurity camps for, for kids, I on the very last day, I talk about human factors, I talk about social engineering and so on. And I, I allow them in their groups led by uh, student leaders. I say, okay, you have an hour in your groups to develop a, to develop a spear phishing email targeting me. And, and so here's the thing. I consider myself an expert in this and I know it's coming. I know it's coming, but they are so good at this and they get so into it that they still get me. And I don't click on a link. I'm not divulging any personal information, but I get these emails and I'm like, wait, is this real? And even though I know it's coming, I'm like, is this real? Because sometimes these, these kids are good. They're, they're seventh to 12th graders. They will send an email from an account. They'll create real quick an email account purporting to be an angry parent of one of the kids. How am I going to ignore that, right? How am I going to just disregard that? Because what if it's real? And oh my gosh, what happened? What did they do? So, you know, these, these kids are clever and they really get into it. Going back to what I was saying before is... I remember doing this and I was, I was showing them 
clips and I, I got rid of all the personal information in case it was a real email. And I saw this, this girl turn her camera on because we did this as a virtual camp that hadn't had her camera on before. And I saw her smiling and I said, is that, was that you? And she's like, she's like, yeah. And I'm like, that was good. That was good. You know, and you see some people uh, light up because maybe that's where they're interested in cybersecurity or maybe that's how they can best contribute. So, um, but, you know, at the end of the day, shame, you know, as a, as a parent of two young kids, I try and be mindful of this too. You know, I don't want to shame my kids just to make them feel really bad because it's just, it, it's, it's not a good recipe for success. So, um, and then the other aspect that is kind of an interesting emotion is regret, right? And we, we've all felt regret. I've, I've felt regret plenty of times um, this week, even, you know, like wish I could have done X, Y, and Z a little bit differently, maybe had better success or, or whatever, um, you know, and, but what's interesting about regret is it doesn't have to be fully negative. It doesn't have to be a fully negative emotion is we can use the regret. We can leverage regret if we create a conducive environment to it where people are more likely to learn from it. They don't want to feel that regret again. And so you know, it can create a good learning environment where they change their behavior in the future. And then not only is that person better, but the organization is better too. And so, you know, it can, of course, have negative outcomes. It can really, uh, you can, you know, see people where they just ruminate over it and, and get lost in this, but it can definitely have some positive effects too. And, you know, so we, we, what we have found in our research is that if people have this level of self-blame and, and attribution and uh, they can actually feed into future decision-making it can help them make better decisions. But on the other hand, if the organization is not supportive or maybe the organization was negligent, then the individual who maybe caused an incident is gonna blame the organization. Well, they don't have any regrets and they haven't learned anything, right? And so, you know, having an organization that is supportive and very conscientious can help when these cybersecurity incidents occur because it can um, allow the individual to kind of reflect like, hey, the organization's doing a lot here to help me be effective with these cybersecurity things they're asking me to do. And I made a mistake and I need to learn from this as opposed to an organization that, you know, doesn't create that same kind of culture, that same kind of environment. So. Um, and, and so this kind of goes to an, another possibility is forgiveness in cybersecurity. And again, I'll, I'll preface that with, I'm not talking about malicious actors, malicious insiders, but I'm talking about where it happens probably 99% of the time is these non-malicious people. They, they made a mistake. They clicked on the wrong thing or they didn't do something that they were tasked to do, right? And the, the interesting thing about forgiveness, and this is an ongoing research project, um, so, um, and I'm still collecting data on it and everything else, but this was kind of to wrap up the series we did where we talked about very negative emotions of, of fear and shame. And then we looked at regret, which is kind of in between, it can have positive effects. And then we're looking now at, at forgiveness, you know, is there room in organizations for forgiveness when someone causes a cybersecurity incident? And again, there's always exceptions, but to the extent that it is possible, um, it can Im it improve the bottom line. It can make organizations stronger and it can also create stronger uh, relationships and commitment by employees um, to the organization, right? And create more trust and so on and uh, make them more resilient at the same time. The mistakes are going to happen. They're, they're, they're going to happen. They're going to happen with cybersecurity. Uh, they happen all the time. But what can we do to, you know, figure out how we can learn as an organization and become better and stronger as a result, right? And, you know, I, I, it's one of these cliches that I, uh, you know, I could tell my kids or my students, like, it's not a mistake if you learn something from it, right? And, and I'm, not, I'm not trying, I don't wanna overstate that because I know these mistakes can be very costly. They can be very time consuming. This isn't like a, a you know, a panacea. It's not, this isn't gonna cover all mistakes, there's always exceptions, but I think there are a lot of incidents that maybe this could cover where as an organization, you know, you can think about the different approaches you're taking to training people in cybersecurity, dealing with a cybersecurity incident and so on. 
Because at the end of the day, you want your organization to be profitable. You want to move forward. You want to recover from an incident. And that employee or employees that contributed to that mistake or that incident, they might be very valuable in many ways. And so um, you don't necessarily want to just fire people or, or, or um, otherwise discard their contributions to the organization. So, um, and so that, that was kind of the end of the formal part of the presentation. And, but I, I did, you know, if organizations, again, I don't have anything to sell. I'm, I'm an employee of the University of Washington, but I do research all the time and I'm happy to collaborate. If there's ways organizations would like to collaborate and talk about, um, you know, hey, I'm, I'm curious about this. I wanna learn more about the attributes of people that fall for phishing emails in my organization or whatever it might be. Uh, I'm, I'm open to having those conversations. And, and seeing if there's some synergy there where we can kind of help each other out with that. Um, I always have interested students looking for projects to do too. Um, and, you know, like, like I said, the current project I'm working on is uh, looking at forgiveness. And so I'm, I'm still recruiting people that have caused a cybersecurity incident in an organization, just to try and understand their perspective of it. And again, seeing what we can learn from it at the same time. So what's an ideal, is there an ideal collaborator? Um, like, is are you looking to work with organizations of a certain size or in certain industries? And the follow-up is, uh, and how do they get in touch with you? Are, are you okay with me sharing your contact information? Oh, there, there we go. <laughs> You'll share your contact You're one step ahead of me. <laughs> yeah, so, so feel free. You know, it, it's hard to answer that one question because sometimes, I don't know until I, I, I hear it. I'm like, oh, I, I didn't think of that. And so I don't want to pigeonhole myself and say, I'm looking for this type of organization, right? Because, uh, you know, you, you, all your organizations are, are different, some more so than others. And it might be a really interesting angle or perspective to take. And as far as size goes, you know, I don't, you know, an, an organization of the size of one, which which exists, right? That might be a little bit difficult to do some of this stuff. But Beyond that, I, I think there's, uh, you know, I, I'm open to conversations because, um, you know, I, I think a lot of times studies focus on larger organizations because maybe it's easier to study sometimes because you feel like you can get enough people to participate or something. Um, but, you know, I, I, I'm open to conversations to kind of see what your questions are, what your curiosities are, and see if there's some way I can benefit you with my, with my, my research team and and, and things we can look at. And, and I will say, um, going back to the ethics side of it, is if I did interview or studied your employees, I would not then say, hey, look at what this employee said, or look at what this employee divulged to me about your company. I I would never do that. Um, it's actually basically against the rules here. I would, I would never get approval to do that kind of research, uh, nor would I feel good about that. I, I'm not going to do research that places someone's employment status or their livelihood in jeopardy. Um, and so I protect, you know, the, the information of, of those that, you know, are willing to participate in a study. And I do compensate my participants for uh, participating in the study for the one that I'm, I'm having people fill out a basically a survey, but it's really open ended questions, it takes maybe 20 to 30 minutes, I'm paying them $20 cash. And so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm always happy to participate. I think it's an error to compensate my participants. I always make sure that I can do that. So awesome. That makes sense. Well, we do have a few questions that have come in. Great. But before I get to those, I also want to comment. So th this has been fascinating. And um, when the recording is available, I know I'm going to go back and review it. And I know there are a few things that are going to be those rewind moments where you say something once and I need to go back and hear it again. So I'm, I'm looking forward to going through that. And I would also encourage, as I was listening, there was something that you said, you had the image of the a snake and you talked about security as an abstract concept. And I want to mention this both to you and to people attending. Uh, we had a guest speaker at a webinar about a year ago. It was Dr. Eric Huffman, and he was talking about the psychology of cybersecurity. And that webinar is available at EXP Academy. You can review it. That's at academy.exptechnical.com. But one of the things that he pointed out is that like your image of a snake, we're hardwired to jump away from that image. You've got, you know, six million years of evolution that that causes us to fear snakes, but we're also nurtured into believing that when we get email from our mom 
that it really is email from our mom. So we don't, you know, his point in that, in the psychology of cybersecurity, and it was a great presentation, but was about all these vulnerabilities that exist just because you're human yeah. and you're not trained to recognize these threats that in the, you know, in the, in the broad span of human existence have only happened in a, in a, you know, a, a fraction of a second, evolutionarily speaking. Um, so that was one. Um, I would encourage people to go back. And again, that, that webinar was entitled The Psychology of Cybersecurity, and it's available at EXP Academy for Rewind. I had, there was one question too, and I'm going to editorialize this because there was a question about, um, you talk about forgiveness as a positive, but can it be negative? And I'm going to add my own, I, I think I understand this too. Here's a confession. I watch reality TV, and I watch the worst reality TV, and that is um, Love is Blind. And in the, uh, my wife and I were watching it last night and I, I thought about something similar to this question. And that was that at one point, one character on that show, one person, they're real people, but uh, said uh, to another, I forgive you for what you did to me. <laughs> and the person saying that meant it in the utmost sincerity. The person hearing that, her eyes turned to slits and she kind of pursed her lips and she didn't comment on it but it seemed like she viewed that with contempt she she probably yeah. thought this person using that word forgiveness is being sanctimonious they're not being uh you know i'm not hearing it in the spirit intended do you have you experienced that or in your early research into forgiveness is there is there a warning to you to people to avoid using that yes sense? yes um we we actually address that in our working paper right now. It's something that I mentioned that, you know, how do, how do we use forgiveness if we are going to use forgiveness? What would that look like and how there could be negative consequences? And, it, and it, you, 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 you nailed it on the head with your example there because that's, that's exactly right. It's like um, someone can be very genuine and they can say, oh, I, I forgive you. And it's like, forgive me for what? I didn't do anything or I didn't, I didn't do something to the extent you think I did. So, you know, this, this quote unquote forgiveness is actually almost an accusation or it's almost something worse. Right. And it's like, and then it creates more hostility and, and other things. And so I, I think, you know, creating a forgiveness organization is, it's not necessarily always this formalized mechanism of locking up and saying, I forgive you, right? Um, but I think this forgiveness culture is like, well, if there is a cybersecurity incident and someone clearly caused it accidentally, you know, how are you going to handle that? Are you going to handle that in a forgiving manner? Are you going to require an apology? Are you going to, you know, what does that look like? And it could be this, this blame shame thing that you focus on, right? Or it could be like being more open to having a conversation and saying like, hey, you know, let's have a conversation. What do you think we as an organization can learn from this? How do you think we can be more supportive to try and make sure that these types of things don't happen in the future? The employee might be like, I don't know, probably nothing. You know, I know you guys trained me on this. I watched that video on demand training program <laughs> or whatever. And I remember this very well from being a state employee. Every year, you'd have to do these, these trainings, right? Um, and, and, and that's fine, you know, and, but how you approach that, I, I think, is really important. Um, and it really sets the tone for what kind of organization you want to be. And I, I remember this from um, when, I, when I was studying governance risk management compliance many years ago, and I was looking at, you know, what can organizations in new and developing countries learn through continuous improvement lifecycle approaches like, you know, plan, do, check, act. And you saw plan, do, check, act implemented in, uh, with Toyota in, in Japan post-World War II, and it was immensely successful. And uh, because part of that, part of why it was successful is it allowed employees to be part of the process to speak up and create, a, you know, I'm not saying it was always played out ideally, but that was the intent behind it, is where employees can be part of the process, that they were considered important enough to say, hey, why don't we change how we're doing this to make it to make it more efficient or in the case of security to make it more secure um, so i think there's lots of rooms for those kinds of conversations and how you approach uh, the creating that forgiveness culture but but you're right you know there you have to be mindful of doing that and sometimes people do that very genuinely well i forgive you 
sometimes people do it very maliciously too, right? Right. And um, it's like, I'm going to get them. I'm going to um, really show them because I'm going to act like the bigger person, but I'm not really being the bigger person. Right. <laughs> a friend of mine used to say, it, this is similar, but he said, an undeserved compliment is like a hair in your milk. <laughs> and I'm, I'm thinking, <laughs> you know, that insincere forgiveness is the same. It stands out and it's repulsive. Um, yeah. But uh, on that, I'm going to change subjects. There's a, a, a comment and a question here that I'm going to read in full because it's very long, um, but it's it's complimentary too. And it says, and we have just, I think maybe just enough time for this and maybe one other comment, but it says, I just pulled up a Wall Street Journal article from 2020 about this topic that I saved last year. And I see that you're the co-author. <laughs> so congratulations <laughs> on that. The article has informed my approach to working with end users. I always thank users for reporting potentially harmful emails, et cetera. And I've advocated to management to not threaten our staff with fear-based cybersecurity policy. That is, don't write anything like, if you continually click phishing links, you'll be written up. Or if you compromise us, you're fired. So the question is, how do you sell the idea of a buddy system that is a more hands-on person-to-person -person approach to cybersecurity training versus mandatory training videos when the cost is almost certainly higher and IT staff are frequently not well suited to training. Yeah, I, I think it, it is interesting. And, you know, even talking about um, IT staff in a lot of organizations, a lot of times cybersecurity is forced upon them because it has to do with the technical aspect. And they may not have any formal cybersecurity training too. But, um, you know, I think the answer to the question is, you know, there are many different ways that this could be uh, approached. And I think a buddy system is, is, is maybe one good way. I think there's technologies out there too that make it really easy to just be like, click on the email and as, as suspicious or you're not sure. Um, and, and then other, you know, other organizations, you, you forward it to a specific email account or to the IT staff and say, hey, I got this, I'm not sure. But I, I think it's having those mechanisms in place to make sure people can learn from it. And I think, you know, having real life examples of, hey, here's a phishing email organization received and mm -hmm. it was reported as, as possibly being suspicious. In this case, they were correct in reporting it or in this case they weren't and, and here's why. And, um, but you know, at the end of the day, when in doubt, report it. You know, if you have any, any question at all, you know, report it. And I think it's, it's really trying to create that environment where it it places it, it takes the onus off of individual employees to make that determination all the time because again they're not trained for it and to find mechanism whether it's a buddy system or whether it's some kind of reporting system to make it as easy as possible because again this is getting in in, in their way of doing their actual work right, right. and so um, yeah that, that my my colleague Karen she does periodic uh, articles for Wall Street Journal. And so she talked about some of the research we worked on together. So I'm like, that was cool. And so I think she did one for a shame too. I'm like, I'm like oh, cool. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I, I do want to give credit to Karen Renault because she's one of my, uh, Renault because she's one of my uh, main con uh, collaborators as well as Rosalind Sir, who we've worked on the shame, regret, and, and now the forgiveness stuff because uh, they're, you know, wouldn't have been impossible without their contributions and their collaboration. Awesome. Thanks. And we're, we're butting up against our time limit. I uh, have a couple of things to, to add, and then we'll go to you for the last word. And one is when in doubt report is great because that's, that is a forgiveness sort of paradigm, isn't it? It's, it's an open door amnesty approach to cybersecurity rather than a blame and shame. Um, the other, uh, I do want to comment uh, my first ever poll. Thank you all for participating. 64% answered no, not that I'm aware of, in um, recognize fear, shame, or regret. And I have to confess, I was a little bit disingenuous. Nearly every invitation that I sent included something like, you won't want to miss this event, <laughs> which people talk about as fear of missing out. But I think you might, Mark, determine, categorize that as anticipatory regret, imagining a point in the future where you regret something that you didn't do in the past. Right, so right. <laughs> near, near, we should have probably had close to 100% on that, on that poll, but... Uh, I thank everyone for participating. And with that, we're at 12.59. Mark, do you have any final words as we wrap up here? Um, you know, I, I would just say, feel free to reach out to me. You know, I'm always happy to have a conversation. And, um, you know, I, I really enjoy the opportunity to be here and, and to talk about this stuff. You know, it's, 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 it's my passion area. And I, um, yeah, but, but feel free to reach out to me and we can have a conversation. And even if you're not 
sure if it makes sense you know you don't know until uh we, we have a conversation and, and see if we can help each other and, and maybe um try and address these issues together because they're big issues they're big challenges indeed well thank you so much for participating i've really enjoyed this i've learned a lot i sincerely enjoyed our conversation i hope the people in, in attendance did as well and with that i think we'll say goodbye to our audience and we'll wrap things up here but thank you once again for participating and thanks for everyone who attended Thank you so much. All right.